both sides of lung. And this is a patient, uh, uh, 17 of the lung system, which is a mixed uh, uh, pattern with both GGO and consolidation. Uh, also bronchoectasis and the pleural effusion on both sides. And the imaging manifestations of COVID-19 are influenced by many factors, such as the time interval to see scan after the initial clinical symptom, the viral load and toxicity, the body immune reaction, comorbidities, oxygen supporting players, especially antiviral drugs and other treatment related factors. So the imaging manifestations of COVID-19 are influenced by many factors, actually. Uh, this is a good study uh, showing us the combination of uh, imaging features of COVID-19. This is that before the onset of the UDs, GGO will account for the majority of CT findings. But uh, one week after the central onset, there will be GGO and some reticular pattern and consolidation. And this is uh, one to three, two weeks after the onset. Uh, this is uh, two to three weeks after onset, there will be mixed pattern of these uh, imaging changes. This is actually a uh, case of a 26 uh, year old male. This is the day 12 after the onset of Leolis. The CT scan shows uh, diffuse bilateral GGO with some consolidations, uh, lesions inside. Uh, this is the 19 days after onset. Uh, you can see the progression of GGO into very widespread consolidation of the lungs. And uh, sadly, this patient died about 15 years later after C scan. So based uh, upon uh, what I have described for the CT findings, the diagnostic criteria of COVID-19 in China, the safest addition emphasizes the importance of our imaging in support, supporting the clinical diagnosis. Of course, the lab test, especially the PCR, for the nucleic acid of the virus is a, a golden standard for diagnosis. But if it's not available or if it takes a long time to acquire the result, then the imaging findings and the epidemiological history, clinical characteristics will combine support the prompt uh, treatment or prompt management of those patients who are still waiting for the PCR results. And from this, you know, uh, our government uh, established the first edition on January 23rd and uh, on March 3rd, the seventh edition, almost one new edition per week. This reflects the fact that the COVID-19 is very complex, very tough disease that we changed our uh, guidelines every week according to the experience or the lessons learned during the past week. Now this slide is a comparison of chest CT imaging and the uh, X-ray radiograph. And uh, I, 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 I listed the merits of chest imaging here. Uh, it can reflect the start or early change of interstitium of the lung. So for the early detection of the uh, COVID-19, the, the, the lung change CT is more sensitive than chest X-ray. And uh, See, uh, as I analyzed before, the CT can reflect the histopathological change of the disease more precisely. So it can be, we can use it for image post processing to uh, provide a better picture of the disease, the environment of the lung uh, segments or lobes. And the diagnosis and differential diagnosis on CT scans can be much easier than uh, DR X ray. Uh, you can evaluate the disease severity, the staging, grading, uh, evolution, and the complications are more appreciated on CT images than DR. And of course, the system now for the treatment response is more accurate than DR. And another important aspect of CT image is that we can provide quantitative approach for each data. I wish you would know about the quantification of the immune data. And this allows for the application of AI uh, analysis of the data. And I believe uh, 
Professor Jung will talk about more in, in his lecture. Here is the limitations of CT. Uh, radiation dosage, of course, uh, should be considered. And the availability and the bedside accessibility of CT is also a big concern, especially for patients who are in ICU intensive care unit and put on tubes is a, a big problem for them to have CT scan. And the risk of infection exposure is more uh, risky performing CT scan than the uh, bedside uh, DR. And of course, cost uh, concern is also a, a limitation of uh, chest CT. Here I made a comparison. This is a very slight, very small GGO of the lung. But on the chest X-ray, you can observe such change, but you should be very, very careful to look at it. But on CT, I think it's very easy to realize such early subtle change. Now, this slide is just want to show you that with the post position of the CT images, we can appreciate more about the precise location of the lesion and uh, like this. So we can have a very uh, comprehensive picture uh, of the environment of the lung by the viral pneumonia. Now, uh, we can apply uh, artificial intelligence based on our CT images. For example, we installed the AI software on our CT scanner, and uh, after the technician finished the CT scan, and the, the software will check the images automatically and it will pump up a warning side if the imaging patterns are compatible with the diagnosis of uh, COVID-19, for example, here. This is, this is done only in two to three seconds. So very quick automatic warning for the technicians. And the technicians can call the uh, readers on duty to consult on the diagnosis. And this is showing you the quantification of uh, the lesion, both its volume and the density. For example, in this case, the volume of the lesion is quite small. This lesion, the volume is large, but it's the pure GGO. It's the GGO with clear pavement pattern. The density of the lesion is higher than this one. And this patient had, had more severe clinical presentations than this patient. And we believe that the analysis of this sense, the, the volume, the number, the distribution of pulmonary inflammatory lesions are very important to be used for the differentiation of interstitial infiltration and the income consolidation and provide some clues for the analysis of the composition and the viscosity of the available extrudes. And we will know that in severe or critical ill patients, their, the hypoxia of the patients is very hard to be uh, reversed by traditional oxygen supporting layers. And we have to think about the, how to deal with the whiskers of sputum of the patients. And I think CT analysis will provide a clue to future uh, treatment plan. And this is, this is a, a, a one of our research is on, on undergoing that we monitor the, AR, the, the grading of ARDS with the quantification of CT size. For example, this is three cases with different uh, CT scan, and the software automatically uh, segment and label the, uh, the, the lesion and the measure the density, the volume, and we got the infectious preparation for this patient is about uh, 34%. The blood uh, oxygen pressure it's around uh, 300. This is a mild case of ARDS. For this one, the infectious proportion is less, but the hypoxia is more severe, and this is a progressive ARDS. For this one, uh, the, 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 it's comparable with this number, uh, but the, uh, the patient is common from ADS. That means some measured quanti uh, imaging biomarkers of CT scan can be used to uh, evaluate the severity of ARDS. This will provide guidance, supporting evidence for clinical treatment of such problems. 
Now I move to another topic about how to uh, operate the Department of Reality during the such crisis. And uh, the top priorities of our thinking is that first, we should protect our uh, staff, the personnel from infection. Second, we should prevent any cross infection uh, within the Department of Radiology. The third is to maintain the regular or routine uh, radiological service to other hospital patients. So bearing that in mind, we set up several uh, things together and uh, we published a paper, uh, our, our uh, paper in the Journal of ACR. It was just announced yesterday. And you, if you have interest, you can look at, download it for, for read. I think the first one is to set up the leadership. The leadership of the Department of Radiology is very important because it carries out the co all coordination, the development, the implementation and supervision of all procedures and measures against uh, COVID-19. So leadership, I think, is the most important thing uh, for a Department of Radiology to deal with such crisis. The second one is reconfiguration of our examination areas. Uh, as uh, in this uh, paper, uh, our department area were divided into four zones. The contamination zone for favor CT and favor DR for favor patients or suspected patients of uh, COVID-19, and uh, some semi-contamination area and the area of drain and a buffer area, etc. And I think you can have a good look at the paper if you if you have a chance to read it. And uh, staff protection uh, is, is uh, very keen uh, in my department. And I just showing you the different uh, PPE of our staff. This is depend on the uh, danger risk of the exposure to patients. This is a PPE for favorite city room. They have the protective clothing, the goggles, the N95 mask, and so on, everything just like doctors working in ICU. But for personnel working in non favor CT scan, they wear things like this. Then for ordinary CT, like for chest CT scan, ordinary CT or for MRI, they wear things like this. For radiologists, we just wear surgical mask. And we develop some special uh, operating procedures for uh, both the favor uh, CT, DR, and ordinary chest scan. These are the flow chart uh, showing you the uh, workflow of our uh, procedures. And several other measures, for example, the uh, disinfection or discontamination, uh, the, the procedures for the imaging rooms, the machines, and etc. we are strictly adhere to the uh, requirements of uh, uh, the infection control uh, experts. And the implementation of other precaution strategy for startup trees and factors like uh, social, keep social distancing. We cancel many in-person meetings, but instead we use WeChat video meeting calls to communicate with the staff or the faculty of our department. This is to minimize group gathering. And uh, some doctors, we just uh, let them work from home to deal with the diagnosis. And uh, of course, as I said before, uh, our hospital is the uh, a hospital with 5,000 hospital beds. So we have to, on one hand, deal with the crisis of uh, COVID-19. On the other hand, we have to provide normal reduction service to other patients as well. So I think we have achieved the goal. This is the number shows that uh, from uh, January 17 to April 4, 6, for respiratory city, we had more than 600 scans. Uh, for the chest city, or, or uh, it's around 48,000 uh, such gas, and none of our faculty, staff members, or health care workers were infected by the virus. And, uh, and at the same time, we sent four of our staff, including radiologists, to Wuhan to help with our department there uh, to combat the, uh, the COVID 19 virus. And they all returned home safely because they also obeyed all the regulations for uh, infection control. Now, finally, I would mention uh, uh, other things uh, about our experience, uh, such as uh, the new technologies uh, applied for the fighting of COVID-19. You know, in China, uh, especially in Wuhan, uh, the government set up many uh, makeshift hospitals like this. It's originally an indoor studio. It was converted into the uh, makeshift hospitals 
with a capacity of more than 800 beds. And uh, some companies put the container city outside the building as the standalone city scanners for the patients here. So you can see this is city scanners of the room, all things done with uh, the regulation of the uh, infection control process. process. And this also we have vehicle city uh, within the trunk of this vehicle, a 64 slash city scanner is put here, this is upper room, and this also can be served standalone for the makeshift hospitals in China. And I believe in China, the uh, container city scanners and the weak scanners, they have very good uh, sales uh, during the uh, pandemic period of time. Now about the 5G technology. We use both the 5G technology for the remote control, remote operating of the container city scanners. This is a, uh, our chief uh, technician, uh, technician. He is operating the scanners in Wuhan city via the Wuji technology. This is, he is sitting in our department, but operating city scanners in Wuhan, in Wuhan city of three province. This is, uh, I think, it's a very good practice. Also with the 5G technology, uh, we uh, prepared the teleconference for multidisciplinary expert consultation every day for the treatment of severe and critical ear pain of our Sichuan province. And uh, because of the effort, we in the, in the whole province, we have uh, near 1,000 patients, but only three patients died of COVID-19. Uh, many severe uh, ear patients were rescued by such uh, multidisciplinary experimentation through 5G technology. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Song, for the very informative uh, lecture. Um, before we go on to the next speaker, uh, for those who have just uh, joined the webinar, uh, there will be a Q&A uh, session at the end and you may ask your question using the Q&A button at the bottom part uh, of your toolbar. The next speaker would be uh, Professor uh, Yoon Sun Ho from uh, Seoul National University Radiology Department. Uh, Professor Yoon will now share with us the experience from Korea. Professor Yoon, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Suno Yoon uh, from Seoul National University Hospital. Today, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, city findings of COVID-19 outside China, diagnostic accuracy of RT-PCR and CT in COVID-19, and consensus statements from the RSNA and the Fractional Society and uh, AI automatic CT quantification of COVID-19 pneumonia. The first topic is the CT findings of COVID-19 outside China. Radiology studies outside China uh, have been published from uh, Korean, Japanese, and Italian researchers. The CT findings of COVID-19 pneumonia uh, in Korea, Japan, and Italy are generally consistent with those of COVID-19 pneumonia in China. Peripherally distribute, distributed multifocal ground glass opacity uh, with some patch consolidations and a posterior part or lower lobe involvement for the predilection. And nevertheless, the frequency of CT abnormalities and uh, consolidated lesions in the ground glass opacity in COVID-19 were not identical across countries. Uh, those frequencies seem seems lovely correlate with a, a case fatality rate. The countries having a high case fatality rate tended to have to a higher frequency of CT abnormalities and consolidated lesions in the ground glass opacities. 
according to the situation report of the WHO uh, as of a, uh, April 16th, Singapore has a very low case fatality rate and COVID-19 patients may they have less frequent uh, CT abnormalities and consolidative lesions in ground glass opacity uh, compared to uh, other countries. A AI-based uh, GE reconstruction algorithm to fidelity uh, may help to avoid a uh, misperception of minute ground glass opacity. And three uh, representative images are reconstructed by a, with a uh, filtered back projection Acer and True Fidelity, and images reconstructed by a filtered back projection and Acer seem to show a peribronchial ground glass opacities in the right lower look, but we can exclude the presence of the ground glass opacity in the images reconstructed with a True Fidelity. In summary, uh, COVID-19 has a, a similar CT pattern uh, regardless of geographic location. And CT severity of COVID-19 seems lawfully associated with a, a patient characteristics and the patient with COVID-19 in Singapore may have a, a slightly uh, milder CT severity than those in other countries. Next, let me deal with a, a diagnostic accuracy of RT-PCR and CT in COVID-19. Several studies from China suggested that a, a CT scans could be used as a, a primary screening or diagnostic tool for COVID-19 in epidemic areas. However, uh, conflicting viewpoints exist on this issue. The ACR recommends that CT should not be used to screen for or as a first line test to diagnose COVID-19. So our team promptly conducted a, a systematic literature review as of April 3rd to meta-analyze a diagnostic accuracy of RT-PCR and CT in COVID-19. For CHSCT, a pooled sensitivity and specificity were 94% and 37% respectively, and the pooled sensitivity of RT-PCR was 89%, and the specificity of RT-PCR was 100%. And there is a substantial heterogeneity on the pooled estimates for CHSCT and RT-PCR. CHSCT had a higher sensitivity in studies with a higher proportion of severe disease, and comorbidities and a lower proportion of asymptomatic patients. And RT-PCR had a higher sensitivity in studies with a lower proportion of elder patients. These two figures show estimated positive and negative predictive values of CHSCT and RT-PCR. The bottom bar indicates a disease prevalence and the left bar uh, denotes a, a predictive values. The transparent blue box indicates a lower, low prevalence lesions, and blue dots indicates the prevalence of uh, predictive values in Singapore. Given the low specificity of CCT uh, scan, there is a, a large gap in the positive predictive value between CCT and uh, RT-PCR in low prevalence lesions. And this table presents estimated predictive values of CHSCT and RT-PCR for COVID-19 in nine countries based on their actual disease prevalence. The prevalence was defined as the proportion of the patients diagnosed with COVID-19 among those tested with RT-PCR. In low prevalence countries, uh, positive predictive values of a uh, RT-PCR were more than 10 times higher than that of a CT, a CT scan. The negative predictive value, values of both methods range from a 99% to 99.9%.
In summary, a CHSET scans for the primary screening or diagnosis, diagnosis of COVID-19 would not be a beneficial in a low prevalence region uh, due to the substantial rate of pulse positivity of CHSET scan. Now let's look into the uh, consensus statements from the RSNA and the Fleischner Society. So RSNA uh, provide expert consensus statement on reporting chest CT findings related to a COVID-19 in March 25th. The statement aims to provide the guidance and confidence to radiologists in reporting COVID-19 and to increase clarity uh, to clinicians uh, through reduced uh, reporting variability. The state statement uh, proposed four categories based on the city findings in the literatures and the typicality of city features in COVID-19 pneumonia rather than other disease. A typical appearance, indeterminate appearance, atypical appearance, and negative for pneumonia. Uh, typical appearance indicates the CT findings more specifically seen in COVID-19 pneumonia. Peripheral bilateral GGO or multiporcal lung GGOs, as shown in this figure, without or with consolidations with or accreditating appearance. And reverse halo sign or other findings of other uh, organizing pneumonia can be seen in COVID-19. And uh, the principal differential diagnosis includes some viral pneumonias, especially influenza and acute lung injury patterns, uh, particularly for uh, organizing pneumonia. Indeterminate appearance indicates CT finds that have had been uh, reported in COVID-19 pneumonia, but are not specific enough to reach a relatively confident radiological diagnosis. Essence of typical appearance and non-peripheral, non-lound, diffuse, perihilar, or unilateral GGO, or a few very small round glass opacities. And this finding is common in COVID-19 pneumonia, but occurs in a wide variety of diseases, such as acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, pneumocystis infection, and a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, which are difficult to distinguish by imaging alone. Atypical appearance indicates uncommon CT findings in COVID-19 pneumonia, and it is more typical of other diseases, such as uh, isolated lower or segmental consolidations without ground glass opacities, discrete small nodules or tree in both appearance or cavitation, and smooth interlobular septal line thickening with the pillar effusion. In summary, the RSNA suggests a standardized four categories on reporting chest CT findings related to COVID-19, depending on the current literature and expert consensus. Recently, the Fleischner Society provided the consensus statement on the role of chest imaging in patient management during COVID-19 pandemic based on a multinational, multi-departmental expert opinion. This document is structured around three clinical scenarios and three additional situations in which a chest imaging often is considered in the evaluation of patients with potential COVID-19 infection. Key components for uh, Common clinical scenarios include disease severity, pretest probability, risk factor for risk uh, disease progression, and resource constraints. Disease severity and progression are clinically assessed, for example, depending on the presence of hypoxemia or dyspnea. Pretest probability is defined by the background prevalence of COVID-19 in the affected areas and can be individually modified by a history of exposure to COVID-19 patients. Risk factors for poor outcomes in patients with COVID-19 are based on 
a clinical assessment and result constraints indicate the limitation on hospital resources, PPE or COVID testing. The first scenario uh, addresses a patient at an outpatient clinic or via telemedicine with a mild respiratory feature consistent with COVID-19 infection and no significant resource constraints. In these scenarios, imaging only indicated for patients with a risk factor for COVID-19 progression and either a positive COVID-19 testing or moderate to severe, about moderate to high pretest probability in the absence of COVID-19 testing. The second scenario addresses a patient presenting with a moderate to severe features consistent with COVID-19 infection and no significant resource constraints. In this scenario, imaging is advised regardless of the results or availability of COVID-19 testing, given the impact of imaging in both circumstances. For COVID-19 positive patients, imaging establishes a baseline pulmonary status and identifies underlying hardware pulmonary abnormalities that may facilitate risk stratification. The third scenario addresses a patient presenting with moderate to severe features consistent with COVID-19 infection in areas with high community disease burden and critical resources limitations such as in Wuhan, China, Italy, Spain, and New York City. In this scenario, urgent decision making and triage are of primary importance. The turnaround, time, the turnaround times for COVID-19 test results ranged from uh, six to over 48 hours in, with most sites. This is an impractically long time period to consider triage to limited hospital bed and ventilators. And rapid COVID-19 test indicates a point of care test with a less than one hour turnaround time. And imaging is advised when a point of care COVID-19 testing is available and positive. Also, imaging is advised to support more rapid trials of patient in a resource constraint settings when a point of care COVID-19 testing is not available or negative. Uh, because uh, it is because imaging may reveal uh, features of COVID-19 for medical triage or associated decision uh, regarding dispositions or infection controls and clinical management. And in a uh, resource limited settings where access to CT is limited, a chest X-ray uh, may be prepared for patient with COVID-19. Additional recommendations are as follows. Imaging is not indicated as a screening tool for COVID-19 COVID in asymptomatic individuals. And imaging is indicated for patients with COVID-19 and evidence of worsening respiratory status. And daily chest radiographs are not indicated in a stable intubated patient with COVID-19. And CT scans is indicated in a patient who has a functional impairment or and or hypoxemia after the recovery of, from COVID-19. And COVID-19 testing is indicated in a patient who is found instantly to have a typical findings of COVID-19 on a CT scan. In summary, Imaging is not indicated for patients with mild features of COVID-19 unless they are at risk for this progression. And imaging is indicated for patients with moderate to severe features of COVID-19 regardless of COVID-19 test results. And for patients 
with COVID-19 and worsening respiratory status. Finally, I will cover automatic CT quantification of COVID-19. Uh, this is a situation we simulated for taking a CT scan in COVID-19. In our hospital, we use a negative pressure chamber to take the CT scan. And after CT scanning, the areas is dis uh, disinfected at least for an hour. It is very laborious. However, CT scanning can be worse in certain COVID-19 patients. I did identifying those uh, with poor prognosis, a uh, SARS matters, and COVID-19 is very important in determining how to efficiently uh, distribute the limited medical resources. Indications for a uh, poor prognosis include bilateral disease in SARS and also a bilateral disease or greater involvement of lung parenchyma or pleural effusion in bears. And listen to papers. Uh, reported that COVID-19 patients has, uh, can have a poor prognosis if there is a large lymph node, pleural effusion, fibrosis, or a large extent of disease. If we can try the patient who may get worse in advance, it would be very helpful by quantifying this extent on CT images. However, the visual evaluation of this extent requires a considerable little experience, time resources, and is prone to reader variability. So our team developed a pre-downloadable AI software for the automatic quantification of COVID-19 pneumonia on CT images and distributed worldwide in March 18. Uh, MediCOVID contains the 2D unit for local use on computer without concerning data privacy and the software automatically calculates the extent and weight of COVID-19 pneumonia. In the internal validation data set, the intra-class correlation coefficient between the 2D unit and reference values for the extent and weight of pneumonia were around 0.99 and the correlation coefficients were maintained in the Japanese and Italian external validation data set. In summary, uh, CT will probably play a crucial role in treating patients with severe disease and predicting a prognosis. And to achieve this, an early, easily implementable automatic CT quantification tool for COVID-19 pneumonia is freely distributed along with building a large cohort. Uh, these are today's topics that I covered, and this brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. Please stay safe. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank. All right. Thank you, Dr. Yoon, for your sharing. For those who have just joined, uh, there will be a Q and A session at the end of the presentations. You may send your questions via the Q and A options at the bottom of the screen. Next, we have Dr. Yoon Song, consultant of the Department of Radiology, Mount Elizabeth Hospital, Singapore and the immediate past president of the College of Radiology, Singapore. He'll be delivering the lecture on clinical radiology for COVID-19 in Singapore. Dr. Sal, please. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm very glad to share our experience. Of course, um, we cannot compare with the number of cases uh, that we have seen in both China and Korea. Um, so what I want to focus on today is actually some of the workflow issues and the reconfiguration of the department rather than the clinical imaging of COVID-19. So again, just for a little bit of background and especially for those who are not in Singapore, on the 2nd of January, our Ministry of Health notified uh, all medical practitioners of a viral pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China. The first confirmed case was detected in Singapore as an imported patient on 23rd of January. And subsequently, about a week or so after that, on 4th of February, there was local transmission of novel coronavirus in Singapore. This followed the increased risk assessment by the Ministry of Health to DOSCON Orange, and I will evaluate, I will mention what DOSCON is in a short while. In February, travel restrictions were gradually implemented and stepped up. Uh, 
uh, all returning citizens and residents coming into the country uh, were quarantined for a period of two weeks, either at their homes or at uh, community isolation facilities or hotels. Uh, most recently, on the 3rd of April, um, the government instituted circuit patient measures, which is uh, equivalent to a, a partial lockdown where everyone is stay at home. Um, most of the work uh, has stopped and only essential services are allowed to uh, continue operations. Uh, so this is our Singapore's uh, DOSCON assessment level. DOSCON stands for Disease Outbreak Response System Condition. And it is basically a tool um, for the government to determine the, the risk to the uh, population as a whole. So it starts from green, where the disease is mild, yellow, where there's uh, severe, uh, goes on to orange, and in red, the disease is severe and spreading uh, very widely and easily. So right now in Singapore, we are at DOSCON orange and the design stroke uh, in my slides reflects that we are still orange, but not exactly red yet. The other thing that uh, has been done in public health responses is public education on hygiene, uh, mass distribution, advice for travelers, safe distancing advice for seniors um, at workplaces and at eating places. Okay, the first few uh, graphics didn't come out, but um, this is the advice for uh, distancing advice at eating places. So within the hospitals, all patients are now screened, all, all patients since January have been screened for fever, travel and contact history. And of course, the travel and contact history has been changing um, as the weeks go by, as mentioned. So just as an example, this is the uh, entrance to my facility where we have people stationed um, to take down travel history. Uh, visitors are restricted um, from coming in and they have to declare their uh, contact information as well uh, for tracing purposes. So elective surgeries, procedures and including imaging were all postponed. The yellow circle shows um, what we use uh, to screen, which is a thermal scanner. So uh, this person here is watching the thermal scanner for every person who walks through the door. Uh, this is a close-up of the thermal scanner, so it shows both a photographic picture as well as the thermal heat map um, uh, for the co same corresponding picture. So anybody who comes in uh, with a significant fever will be picked up and it saves us the uh, need to have to take temperature, the ear temperature or forehead temperature for every patient or every visitor individually. From the 7th of April, we've only been functioning with essential services only. Um, so all uh, surgeries or imaging procedures have to be declared that they are essential services um, to allow them to proceed. Uh, again, just a little bit of background. So in Singapore, infectious diseases were previously managed at the Communicable Disease Center in Momin Road. Uh, this is an aerial view of uh, the site, and it was actually built initially started in 1913. Uh, along the way, after the Second World War, it was renamed as Middleton Hospital, and it continued as the Infectious Disease Centre in Singapore until the mid-90s. You can see that the buildings are uh, spaced out with a lot of uh, ventilation and air, air in between. Uh, and this was the way that infectious disease cases were managed at that time. So we now have moved into the National Center of Infectious Diseases. It's a 330 bed infectious disease hospital opened in September 2019, and some said just in time. Um, many of the lessons that we learned from SARS in 2003 were incorporated into the design and construction of NCID. So these will include things like negative pressure isolation rooms, single pass airflow without recirculation, uh, separate air handling units to different areas. So for example, patient areas, staff area, visitor areas uh, to receive fresh air supply without cross-contamination. And exhaust air is also treated with uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation, again, to reduce the trans potential transmission of disease. 
So this uh, facility is supported and located next to Tan Tock Seng Hospital in Singapore. And within it, it uh, is embedded X-ray, CT scan, and an angio unit as well for uh, doing procedures and uh, scans for infectious disease patients. I'll go through some of the infection control measures um, that we've had. Uh, personal protective equipment you've seen uh, from both Prof Song and Dr. Yoon. Uh, and obviously, these are stratified for risk. So uh, these are radiographers or CD technicians um, wearing a cap or surgical hat, uh, surgical mask, gown, and shoe covers. So for patients who are deemed at higher risk that are classified as uh, suspect or positive cases of COVID-19, uh, they will change to an N95 mask. And this image shows a nurse being fit tested for an N95 mask. So she wears the mask, um, a, a spray is administered inside the hood to check for any leakage. So if uh, the person can smell or have a bitter taste in the mouth, that means that the mask may not be fitting well and may have to change to a different size or adjust uh, the mask as needed. So other factors that determine the uh, PPE level that you wear include the closeness and the duration of contact. Um, as well as whether uh, you're dealing with a suspect or confirmed case. For those cases where it's at highest risk, um, we add on a PAPR. So this is positive air pressure respirator, uh, which is the hood, um, which allows, uh, allows the reduced risk uh, of transmission of the virus or breathing in of the virus. And of course, together with the gown, the N95 mask uh, and gloves. So uh, it's important to follow the compliance with the hospital guidelines. And of course, keeping up with the hospital guidelines uh, for managing patients is also a task in itself because it keeps changing uh, almost week by week or even sometimes day by day. The other measure where we uh, can uh, help achieve infection control is by segregating the patients. So we can do this by time where uh, dirty or suspect cases are done at the end of the day. Uh, we can do it by space, as Prof Song has showed as well. We restrict the patient movement within de the department. So the gray areas, so this is a floor plan of Tan Tok Seng radiology uh, during the SARS period. And only the gray areas were where we allowed uh, suspect patients to come in. And the clean areas are marked in white. So the other way you can do it is by location. If your hospital has facilities to do so, image as portable. Uh, study or outside the department as far as possible. Again, during the SARS period in Tan Tok Seng Hospital, um, we actually used a portable CT scanner. You can see that it's actually mounted on fuse. So it's not just the table, but even the scanner itself is mounted on fuse and just plugged into the wall. Uh, we were able to scan a uh, CT scan of the thorax uh, and we located this in the empty ward where uh, it we managed to shield off with uh, lead shields and we restricted the passage of uh, patients and staff uh, in this region. For those considering other options for CT scan, again, as Prof Song has showed, um, there are other scanners embedded in the hospital. So for example, in the emergency department, uh, radiation oncology sometimes has uh, CT scan units for treatment planning, as well as uh, the PET CT scan machine in nuclear medicine. So other than the within the hospital, you may have options and also portable or external or newly sighted CT scan machines would be another possibility as well. One of the things for infection control and as uh, Dr. Yun has showed is the concept of enclosing the patient to prevent droplet spread. Yeah, as each breath the patient takes, the, the droplets do pass out and you know, the longer the patient is in your scan room, uh, potentially more and more or further and further the droplets can be spread. So um, NUH Health System in Singapore did a prototype where they have a portable isolation chamber and they published this in radiology in 2016. Uh, so it's an enclosed um, uh, stretcher. There's a HIPAA filter at one end and the patient can be transported and scanned with minimal contact. Uh, so this is the patient inside uh, the isolation chamber. This is a HIPAA filter and then the air is drawn in um, from the top. So this is a close-up picture that shows uh, the point of air entry. 
the patient in the machine. Now, of course, this is an MRI call that is placed over the body. So they did tests on this uh, prototype chamber on both CT, MR, and PET CT, and they actually did not encounter any significant artifacts that were generated uh, by this chamber. Other measures that uh, would be needed to uh, reduce the spread of infection, especially among staff and healthcare workers, is separation by time. So that means um, staff would take one shift, either alternate days, alternate weeks, or so on. But this is not efficient, especially when a large, uh, man, a large amount of manpower is needed to see these cases. You can have different locations within the hospital uh, if you can decant some of the staff into these areas and provide them with uh, reporting stations and the facilities to carry on doing radiology reporting. Uh, the roster planning is also important to be able to distribute uh, the radiology and technology staff equally by in terms of seniority and subspecialty coverage. Another option would be off-site or home reporting. And recently, our government issued a work from home guidance, um, which uh, we do try and comply by. So this is an example of um, my setup at home. And this is the actual computer and the table from which I'm speaking you from, to you from. Uh, so I have a screen at the back, which uh, shows me the packs and its images. I have a smaller dictation screen on my laptop at front. It's obviously a microphone. Uh, and this is my wired network. Um, rather, rather than depending on Wi-Fi. So other areas to consider uh, would be the emergency department, where a lot of times is the first patient that uh, will end, the first point of contact of the patient to the healthcare system. And it's important to be able to separate uh, fever or pneumonia patients from other emergency patients uh, as early as possible to prevent the risk of cross-exposure or cross-infection. So for example, this was in Tan Tok Sing Hospital in 2003 during the SARS period. They built a big tent um, outside the emergency department, made sure that it was well ventilated. Uh, the X-ray area is behind and you can see the lead shields with the radiation sign. So it's important to create new triage and holding areas because most emergency departments now are within the hospital. They're all air conditioned as well. Um, so you need a sheltered open area with natural ventilation. Uh, many of the hospitals have taken over car parks or sheltered car parks. So this, for example, is in uh, Parkway East Hospital where uh, partitions and barriers were built. And the access to these areas was restricted for both patients and staff. That means you couldn't just walk in, you had to be screened to come in. Uh, this is the screening area. The patients wait on these uh, separate chairs, which are uh, distance far apart, again, to reduce the risk of cross-infection, and they wait their turn before they enter uh, this triage area. Chest radiography, obviously, is still the mainstay of in initial imaging evaluation uh, because it is cheap and easy available, and it's important to do it uh, with portable equipment in the fever or triage area rather than bringing in the potential suspect patient into the department. Um, uh, it's easier to bring a mobile x-ray out. Again, this is in 2003. Uh, during the SARS period, we had a chest, a chest stand, and that's the mobile x-ray. And the chest stand is important because uh, for normal x-rays, the patients, uh, the well patients are asked actually to hold the film cassette next to themselves, but uh, some of them are nervous. They don't hold it straight. There's movement and all that. So we've now replaced, chest stands have become obsolete. So we've now replaced that with a uh, propped up uh, cassette either on the chair or trolley. So for example, in this triage area, uh, this is a simulated position. The patient will be sitting here. Uh, the cassette will be placed at the back and the mobile x-ray is directed uh, towards, uh, towards the patient. In a similar way, uh, patients who are on a trolley uh, will have the uh, cassette placed behind them and the radiographer at, at this point is showing a simulated uh, position of the x-ray tube to take this x-ray. So other areas that uh, are of concern uh, outside the hospital are outpatient imaging facilities and uh, some of 
some of our units are actually satellite facilities which are located within community or residential areas. So for example, this is our imaging facility in uh, Jurong, uh, Jurong East. Which you can see it's a residential area. There's a bank, uh, there are shops, there's a uh, eating place next to us. And obviously it's very hard to segregate or limit the amount of access um, into this area. So that's the front door. So it's important to be able to screen uh, the patients at the entrance. Um, so we actually set up a, a screening point. There's a nurse or a receptionist uh, who is wearing the appropriate PPE and interviewing all the patients before they are allowed into uh, the imaging center. Uh, it's also important to have an isolation area within the center. Usually it's a, it's a single room with uh, as little uh, traffic or equipment within as possible. So if you do encounter or there's contact uh, with a suspect or positive patient, the patient is isolated in that area until uh, the medical authorities are notified and transport is uh, secured to bring the patient um, to a hospital. So this workflow for dealing with suspect or positive patients is also important to be able to transmit uh, to all the staff on the ground. Uh, recently, we in Singapore, we've had an uh, increase in the number of cases. So we've had to activate um, another uh, isolation facility. This is at the Singapore Expo. Uh, it's a, actually a large conference facility and our annual scientific meeting was held there uh, for three times recently. So this is the uh, image from inside the convention hall. You can see the uh, setting up um, of the cubicles and the partitions for the patients to stay. Uh, right now, there are two halls with 960 beds and there's a third hall being prepared as well in anticipation of the numbers. This is what it looks like when all the cubicles are built up and within each cubicle, uh, there's a bed, there's a chair, there's PowerPoint, and of course, I think there's Wi-Fi access, uh, which is hard to do without nowadays. To support uh, this facility, um, we have a mobile X-ray unit uh, from NHG Diagnostics, which is located on site. Uh, so this is a trailer, uh, which is now parked outside the expo. Uh, it's under a sheltered area so that patients can uh, go back and forth from their isolation area to this X-ray as needed. Uh, this is the interior of the trailer, which shows the control area, as well as the X-ray room uh, where the patient would have their X-rays done. Uh, so this is a mobile facility and radiographs are transmitted electronically and then reported within the hour. Uh, our numbers are going up. So as of as yesterday, Friday, we actually did 150 cases. We actually reported 150 cases uh, from this mobile X-ray unit. Uh, just to leave, uh, just to uh, have a complete um, look at the whole thing, it's important to have channels of communication uh, within the department and within the hospital. Uh, this is because national hospital and department policies obviously will continually change as new information and new developments come in uh, with more and more knowledge and uh, with time. For example, suspect case definitions, PPE policy, these have changed many times over the course of the last few months. Uh, operational protocols as well. Uh, in my hospital, the last uh, version of the protocol is issued on 17th April, and this is version 17 uh, of the protocol with three annexes, and there's a total of 22 pages. Uh, so it's important to keep up to date um, with what is the current uh, policy. The fact that we now have uh, electronic distribution of the policies, either through email, WhatsApp, or other electronic means has made it easier to transmit uh, all this knowledge. And instead of uh, photocopying stacks of paper uh, to pass around. Uh, but it's important to be aware of information overload and fatigue. Uh, if you imagine the number of just your own uh, messages on your own smartphone. Sometimes you can get like 100, 200 messages a day or more. Uh, so it's very hard for uh, staff to go and skim through and keep up track with every single one. So it's important for the respective section leaders or heads of department to just pick out the relevant protocols uh, which are applicable to your area or within radiology 
uh, it's also useful for to put some hard copy notices of the really important information, for example, like PPE uh, and how to handle patients in staff areas, because then staff who are sort of like waiting or in between cases, uh, they can refer to this. And more importantly, also, they can remind each other of what is the correct or updated policy uh, each time. It's also important to have personal contact uh, in person if possible, if not via phone or video calls, uh, partly because sending out emails and sending out messages, uh, it's a little bit impersonal. So it's important to be able to touch base um, with your staff to both get feedback uh, from them, as well as to look for any gaps and uh, reassure them and inspire confidence in the policies and the protocols. This is a VUCA event of our times, and VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. So as, as times change, these, are, these become more and more, and obviously, uh, this article in Clinical Radiology was published in October 2019. They couldn't have uh, foresaw this coronavirus pandemic, uh, but it seems to be written for it. But some of the take-homes from this article is that even as radiologists or leads or managers in our department, our response and our decisions are actually quite crucial. And we need to be very intentional and uh, be certain as to what we're doing so that it will inspire confidence in the rest of the staff or even our family or friends around us who may not be uh, medical professionals or medically trained. Uh, just a little bit on stress management. Obviously, there's a lot of fear of the unknown, especially when the disease is in its uh, early stage and the numbers seem to be rising. There's obviously a fear of being infected. Uh, we have had in the past healthcare workers being discriminated against uh, because, again, of a fear of the unknown. Um, but one of the things in our modern day is that the valuation of is that stress is bad for me. So because stress is bad, I have to go somewhere to chill out, I have to go and escape on a holiday and all that. But, well, COVID-19 is, you can't run away from anywhere. We can't take any more holidays or we can't travel anymore. We're all stuck at home. So one of the things that you can do is to make sure you acknowledge the stress. And actually doing this moves the neural activity, the anxiety from the amygdala, which is the center for emotion and fear in our brain, uh, to the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the one that does executive control and planning. So it becomes uh, more in the forefront of your thoughts. It's more intentional. Um, one of the things that if you deny that there is stress, it actually uses a lot of mental energy because you feel stressed, but you don't know why uh, you're being stressed. Own the stress. So we realize that as humans, we, we are stressed only because of things we care about. If you don't care about something, it wouldn't even bother you uh, to think twice about it. So if you feel stressed, think about try and analyze it a little bit, connect the feeling of stress to what you value and treasure. And then in the, in the next step, you can actually use it. So to change behavior, to change practice, so true transformative change can take place amid stress and crisis. So you can channel your stress and make it into productive or constructive energy. I want to ask that what will be your response when this is all over? Uh, there's a newspaper article in the Straits Times that says coronavirus should certainly change us. And when all this is over and we look back do we live and respond in accordance to our values or what we believe in? Do we use this opportunity to learn, grow and prepare for the next crisis? Because the next crisis will definitely come, may not become in a form of uh, infection, infectious disease situation, but maybe uh, in a, on a smaller scale in our own personal lives and so on. The author of this article also goes on to say that if at the end of this pandemic, we are the same people and we haven't learned anything, then maybe we have failed. So a thought to think about. Uh, some articles for further reading in the details of uh, how we in Singapore have done some of the reconstruct, reconfiguration and planning for radiology departments. Uh, so one article was published by Lino Ching in the American Journal of Ronchonology, AJR, on the 4th of March. 
uh, there's a group from the National University Health System that published in Journal American College of Radiology in April 2020. And the College of Radiology Singapore also has an article in Clin Clinical Radiology, which is the UK Royal College of Radiologists Journal uh, published 11th of April. So these are all free online to access. And if you would uh, want to go into some of the details uh, that various departments in Singapore have taken uh, to manage the, the uh, control for coronavirus, I would refer you to these articles. In addition, the College of Radiologists has uh, taken the initiative to create a resource site for radiology and imaging. And this is on the website uh, with the web link and address as above, AMS, which is Academy of Medicine Singapore, edu.sg. And on this site, we have different sections. So radiological features of COVID-19. So we uh, show some cases as well as journal articles, uh, management and reconfiguration of radiology departments and imaging centers, personal protection and infection control measures. Uh, these are updates of case definition uh, Singapore Ministry of Health Circulars and Protocols. And we also have some personal anecdotes from the front line, re the reporting room and procedure suite uh, from uh, radiologists and radiology trainees or residents who have actually gone through this first few months of it. This is just a screenshot from what you can get in each section. So uh, previously in March, we did an earlier webinar called Is Your Interventional Radiologist Ready for COVID-19? And that's now available as a video which you can watch on demand. So thank you very much for all your attention. And I'd like to hand the time back over to the moderator. Thanks, Yen, uh, for a very comprehensive review of what the radiology uh, people are doing in Singapore. Uh, we've come to the Q&A segment. So for those of you who uh, still want to ask questions, you are still able to just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, toolbar and you could uh, submit your uh, questions. Um, so I think uh, we have more than 40 questions so far. Um, some of the questions actually the answer uh, are already given in the respective lectures by uh, Professor Song and Professor Yun. Um, I think I'll first uh, ask this first question which appear quite a few times. Uh, this is uh, specifically to Professor Song and Professor Yun. Uh, in your country, for the COVID-19 patients, uh, what proportion of these patients uh, undergo CT scan? Do all of the COVID-19 patients have CT scan or only uh, selected patients have a CT scan? Uh, Professor Song, maybe you go first. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Hong. Um, in China, because the uh, radiologists and the communities realize the importance of CT scan for the uh, early detection of COVID-19 patients, so the use of CT scan uh, imaging for such confirmed or suspected patients is very high. Uh, I have no uh, exact statistical numbers for that, but in my province of Sichuan, the south of China, uh, almost uh, every uh, institution dealing with such suspected or confirmed patients they use this scan for the study, unless the patients are in ICU or are intubated, not uh, uh, accessible for CT scanners. Otherwise, we perform CT scan for such patients. Okay, Professor Yun, what about Korea? In Korea, uh, the proportion of CT scanning uh, differs across hospitals. Nevertheless, a, uh, a, a certain portion of a, a COVID-19 patients with a, a kind of moderate or severe symptoms uh, undergoes a CT scan. Uh, in case with mild symptomatic uh, or asymptomatic patient, uh, we uh, rarely uh, perform a CT scanning uh, for those patients. Yeah, and what about Singapore? What, how do we use CT scans for COVID-19 patients? I think in Singapore, as uh, Professor Yoon has mentioned as well, a lot of times we, deter, we depend more on the RT-PCR swab test. Uh, the criteria for diagnosis in Singapore is two positive, tests, uh, two positive swab tests to confirm uh, that a case is positive. Uh, we find that 
be uh, CT scan is maybe restricted or limited to the use in very severe cases. Uh, so far, the large proportion of our uh, patients have mild symptoms only, and probably only when there's a need to decide on management, that means whether to in introduce a new drug, uh, whether there's uh, you need respiratory assistance or intubation, that the CD scan will be important or useful. Yeah, so Professor Song, with many of your patients with CT chest done, what proportion of the scans are actually normal? And what proportion are abnormal? Uh, uh, if the patients have symptoms, I mean, if the patients have fever and some dry cough or uh, some other respiratory symptoms, the positive rates for CT scan findings will be around 85 to 90%, roughly. Mm -hmm. But of course, not all that are diagnosed as COVID-19. Some are due to other infectious disease of the lung, but it is quite, quite positive when compared to the R, uh, PCR results uh, during the past two months. But now with the improvement in PCR techniques, especially the sampling techniques, uh, the PCR positive rates are increasing. So CT scan in China are recommended as a confirmed diagnosis or uh, with PCR or as a rule out uh, modality for other infections of the lung. Right. Um, again, this is for Dr. Song and Dr. Yun. For patients uh, with normal checks x-ray that go on to have CT, how, what proportion of patients with normal chest x-ray have abnormal CT? Well, uh, the proportion is not very high uh, because uh, as uh, uh, Professor Young said that DR is also quite uh, sensitive to reveal the abnormality of the lung. So if the DR is negative, the chances of positive CT scan will be very low. Only a few early, very mild infiltration of the lung can be discovered by CT. Um, okay, this and uh, this question about pulmonary embolism. Is it common to see pulmonary embolism in uh, patients with COVID-19? Uh, actually, a, a current, a, some of the current guidelines uh, recommends a uh, contrast in a CT scan uh, to detect a uh, pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients. Uh, however, uh, COVID-19 patients had usually, uh, particularly for patients with severe uh, symptoms, uh, typically has a uh, elevated D-dimer uh, test or endivality. And according to one of the uh, researches investigating the uh, prognostic risk factors for uh, a poor outcome, uh, reported that a elevated D-dimer uh, was associated with a poor outcome. But uh, as far as I uh, recently uh, reviewed the uh, relevant study uh, publications in COVID-19, but there yet uh, no uh, researches uh, which evaluate the uh, proportion of pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients. And in our hospital, actually, we uh, have never uh, underwent, uh, performed a contrast in, in the CT scans uh, for COVID-19 patients, so, uh, we don't know uh, the actual prevalence of pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients. Yes, Professor Song, you have any comments? Pulmonary embolism and COVID-19? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Professor Young that the uh, possibility of COVID-19 patients will have high risk of pulmonary embolism because of uh, thrombosis of the deep winner's system. But the, the actual numbers, I don't know exactly how many are diagnosed with pulmonary embolism in COVID-19 patients. Okay. Um, there is a question on uh, pregnant women and uh, the use of CT to uh, rule out COVID-19 before delivery. Uh, what is your opinion on, on, the, on this issue? Uh, in my province and in my hospital, we deal with some pregnant women uh, who have some clinical symptoms of fever, uh, dry cough, similar to COVID-19. 
um, this depends on the, uh, the, 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 the duration of the pregnancy. Uh, for example, if they are in the first trimester of their pregnancy, uh, radiation should be avoided for uh, the protection of the fetus. But uh, if in a late term of the pregnancy, for example, uh, gestation of 35 or 36 weeks, it's, it's okay to perform some uh, immune study for the uh, lady with protection of the fetus. For example, we put uh, some uh, radio protection uh, equipment on the abdomen of the uh, lady to protect the fetus. Hmm. Dr. Jun, in Korea, is it the same? Uh, actually, uh, we do not uh, perform CT scan in pregnant, pregnant women. And uh, personally, I cannot support the use of CT scanning in pregnant women because actually we have never experienced in reviewing chest findings in pregnant women. Pregnant women may have a, a certain degree of a pulmonary congestion, a bit, a particularly uh, just before a uh, delivery. And those in, in some kind of a, uh, any kind of pulmonary congestion may uh, mimic uh, the CT findings of a minute COVID-19 uh, patient pneumonia. So, and, uh, so uh, the uh, disinfection strategy uh, by applying a uh, mask to uh, pregnant women and uh, angle N95 uh, masks for a uh, medical staff would be, uh, I think, a critical way to prevent uh, COVID-19 infection, uh, uh, pre prevent uh, from the COVID-19 infection in the delivery room, I think. Right. Yen, what about in your hospital? Any policy regarding uh, COVID testing before delivery? Um, not, not that I know of, but obviously the... College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists in Singapore, together with their international partners, are coming up with some guidelines as far as I know. Right. Uh, but we don't, so far we've not encountered a patient where we need to scan them. Um, as mentioned, it's, it's easier and in terms of the fetus protection, it's uh, safer to do the swab test uh, and confirm from there rather than to do uh, any form of imaging yet. Right. Just to extrapolate on that, I, I think uh, in Singapore for transplant, uh, renal transplant, uh, for the recipient, there is a requirement in addition to the swab test to do a CT as well. So uh, in Korea and China, is there similar policy for major surgery, asymptomatic patient, do you swab them and do CT just, just in case, you know, to, that the patient may have COVID-19? Uh, well, about uh, um, half a month ago, uh, there's a general consensus among surgeons in China that if we want to perform major surgery for uh, patients, the patients should be scanned for uh, COVID-19, either by uh, DR or CT. But now, because the situation in China is getting uh, much smaller, uh, they, there are no longer requirements uh, for such pre-operative systems of the COVID-19. Dr. Yun, what about Korea? Uh, actually, uh, we haven't uh, any uh, standardized guideline for uh, such situation, but uh, in certain situation, uh, uh, particularly for a uh, transplantation, the possibility of COVID-19 infection uh, should be excluded in 100%. And in in that, those situations, I think the uh, combined use of RT-PCR and CT scanning uh, would be would a baby uh, beneficial for excluding COVID-19 patient uh, COVID-19 infection in 100%. And actually, I uh, personal I, I participated uh, in uh, generating a uh, guideline uh, for a lung cancer patient. Uh, which will be published in JTO. And in the guideline, uh, we suggested, suggested the combined use of RT-PCR and uh, CHCT scanning uh, in the situation uh, that should be excluded uh, the 
the possibility of COVID-19 infection in 100%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Yoon, in your presentation, you described uh, some uh, classification uh, and uh, the, the RSNA guidelines into four categories. Are there similar classification for chest X-ray reporting? Uh, I have never encountered that kind of a uh, classifying system, reporting system uh, for the, uh, for the uh, dedicated to X-ray uh, images in COVID-19 patients. And uh, yes, yes, uh, yeah, there, there had been, there is no uh, such guideline for X-ray images. Yeah. Right. Um, so similarly, I assume uh, in your presentation, there is some prognostication based on CT findings Similarly, is there any prognostic features for chest X-ray? Uh, simply, the presence of a bilateral uh, disease uh, uh, indicates a poor prognosis in even in COVID-19 patients, a, a like experience in uh, SARS or MERS. Uh, if you uh, look at a uh, clinical uh, articles uh, that deals uh, that dealt with a uh, clinical features of COVID-19 patient in China, the presence of a bilateral disease in uh, X-ray imaging was uh, also associated with a, a poor prognosis such as a intubations or death or some kind of or, or ARDS. So the, so the findings is very simple, but uh, bilateral disease uh, is uh, associated with a uh, poor progress on X-ray. Professor Song, any experience from China? Classification of chest X-ray and prognosis patient based on chest X-ray. Uh, well, uh, as I said before, that in China, uh, clinicians and radiologists perform CT scan over chest X-ray. So the majority of research is concentrated on the well, uh, of CT findings. So uh, I agree with Professor Yong that uh, the uh, detailed anatomic inf information generated from CT is very important to classify patients into different risky groups. And uh, of course, for the diagnosis of COVID-19, DR is quite enough, but for the treatment or for the severity evaluation, I believe quantitative CT should be the way to go because this disease is a very terrible disease and its influence nobody can imagine. Okay, there is a question about ultrasound. Is there a role for ultrasound in COVID-19 imaging of the chest? Maybe uh, I can answer it first. Okay. Uh, for the ultrasound, uh, in my hospital, they use it for the ICU patients. That means patients who are in intensive care units, they use the bedside ultrasound to monitor the uh, lung volume, the, the liquid volume, the heart function, and et cetera. It's not used for diagnosis of COVID-19, but for the treatment monitoring for ICU patients. Dr. Yun, any experience? Actually, I don't have any experience in using uh, ultrasound in COVID-19 patients. Okay. Uh, just for the audience, the as I mentioned earlier, this is a two-part webinar series. The next series, there will be a speaker specifically discussing the role of ultrasound in COVID uh, imaging. So for all those of you who would like to know more, uh, please pay attention uh, to look out for our uh, flyer for the next uh, seminar on the 2nd of uh, May. Uh, similar to this question, is there a role of MRI uh, imaging of the chest for COVID-19? There is a question on MRI. Well, uh, in China, we do not perform MRI routinely for the uh, evaluation of patients with COVID-19 with CT or DR. Okay. Um, is there a follow-up protocol for patients with COVID-19? Do you scan 
COVID-19 after they are discharged from hospital? Or is, is there, you only do it for certain patients? Uh, in the discharge criteria uh, in China, there, are, there is some requirements that the patient will come back to the hospital for checkup and the imaging study are included for those patients who pulmonary lesions are not completely resolved and discharged. So they are recommended to come back to the hospital for after uh, one or two months, then probably some immune study will be uh, indicated for them to, to, to be undertaken. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dr. Yun, how about in Korea? Do you have a protocol for follow-up? Uh, actually, uh, we don't have any, uh, uh, we, don't have, we don't have most patients uh, who uh, were discharged from the uh, hospital uh, after the recovery of a COVID-19. So we haven't yet uh, established such a protocol for a CT scanning in discharged patients. Mm -hmm. So in general, for those patients with uh, follow-up chest CT, do the lung recover or do we uh, see scarring or, or uh, what other features do you see? Well, um, the patient is charged from the uh, hospital with COVID-19. Uh, the majority of them with complete resolution of the uh, pulmonary infiltrates. But some patients do have some reticular pattern or fibroproliferative uh, uh, shadows left uh, in the lungs. So they need some uh, checkup, uh, for example, uh, two months or three months or half a year to see if there's a complete resolution or proceed to fibrosis in that stage. Dr. Yun, any experience? Actually, I reviewed some a, uh, reports submitted to uh, Korean General Radiology and uh, in some uh, studies, uh, the uh, of a uh, minute reticular opacities existed in uh, a uh, minor portion of a uh, COVID-19 patient. But uh, the follow-up interval is about one month after discharge. So uh, we don't have any uh, long-term uh, results of a uh, the potential pulmonary fibrosis after uh, COVID-19, uh, after recovery. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are a few questions about uh, processes. So Dr. Yoon, in your lecture, you showed a, a negative pressure transporter for the uh, patients to the CT scan room for CT scan. Uh, and I noticed the radiographer are only in surgical masks. So the transporter is uh, very safe. It is, I assume, is very airtight so that your radiographers are not worried about the uh, infection from the patient. Uh, actually, the uh, representative figure uh, that I showed you uh, is a, a kind of a, a simulated situation uh, uh. for uh, taking a, a CT scan of COVID-19 patients. And when we, uh, uh, our radiological radiology staffs, a, a, a perform CT scan for COVID-19 patients. A, uh, actually, all radiologist uh, staffs a, uh, exist on the control room, city consoles, and actually the uh, uh, physici uh, physician, uh, respiratory physician, physician uh, who uh, mainly uh, taking their COVID-19 patients handles a COVID-19 patient within the uh, negative pressure chamber uh, with a uh, by applying a uh, high level of a uh, PPE. Right. So it's not foolproof. You still need to be the full PPE. Yes. Okay. Ian, you show a similar uh, contraption, but uh, are, are you guys using it or is anybody in Singapore using a similar thing? Okay. So that was, uh, that was an article from the literature. It's a prototype that was tested in the National University Hospital, but uh, I've not heard of it or uh, seen any sort of like commercial uh, product that has come out of that prototype. So I'm not sure what, what uh, the results were. Okay. Uh, there's a question about staff protection. Uh, one of the questions was saying, sometimes patients do not tell the truth 
they hide uh, that they have symptoms and they come to the x-ray uh, department and subsequently found to be positive. So in your department, uh, do all your radiographers wear N95 all the time or uh, it, it is uh, depending on, I guess, I, some of your slides show that if they are in the low risk area, actually they are only in surgical masks. Uh, Professor Song, did you encounter a situation like this where the patient did not tell the truth and uh, actually they were positive uh, patient? Yes, we encountered uh, altogether five cases who have low symptoms and all, who cancelled their epidemiological uh, history, but the chest CT revealed very typical manifestations of COVID-19 and the patients were asked to have the PCR test and they're positive for that test. So that means, uh, so that, that's why we, in our department, we divided the chest imaging into two parts. First one is for favor patients who are suspected to have COVID-19. We have special attention for that and the, the, uh, clinician, the technicians wear uh, the, the, the PPE very properly. Uh, also for chest, CT scan of patients in that period of time, the techniques are also wear certain kind of PPE equivalent to the uh, favorite CT. This, this is the reason why we divide into uh, favorite CT and uh, non favorite CT. They all are well protected against uh, infection. Okay. Dr. Yun, do you have this situation? Uh... Actually, uh, similar with a comment of that uh, professor song. Yeah. Um, do um, what do you uh, do when the staff uh, has been inadvertently exposed to a COVID nineteen patient? Uh, you know, I knowingly. For example, when the patient first got admitted to hospital, uh, there were nobody is suspecting that the patient has COVID nineteen. So only surgical masks or even no masks was worn when they are treating the patient. And if the patient subsequently has COVID-19, how do you deal with the, the staff uh, who has uh, managed this patient? Uh, in my hospital, such staff will be asked to have PCR testing uh, for several times. And they will be asked to stay home for quarantine for two weeks. After two weeks, if nothing happened, they are allowed to come back to work. Right. So is it the same in Korea? Yes, and and fortunately, uh, we haven't uh, never experienced such situations yet. Right. So, Professor Song, any um, of your staff been infected, uh, or your hospital staff, not radiology staff, got infected because of this? No, uh, none of our staff in hospital were infected by the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. So that's what we are quite happy about the result. Right. Okay, there's another question on if the PCR is negative, but the CT shows quite typical changes. How do you handle this patient? Um, these patients in China will be listed as as suspicious patients, and they are required to repeat PCR testing uh, uh, the day after. And the sampling technique of the PCR will be more strict. For example, if uh, the previous one is from the throat swab, they will be performing the laser pharyngeal swab or the sputum with the PCR. And some questions will be uh, uh, accessed uh, um, for these patients. They will be uh, isolated or quarantined for some time un until several PCR proves negative. Right. So how many negative PCR is necessary? If lung changes on CT, three negative PCR, do you still isolate the patient or you can de-isolate the patient? Uh, in the national standard, uh, it's uh, two consecutive PCR tests. If they are negative, then the patient will not be isolated. They will treat the pneumonia for other reasons. Okay, there is a question on pediatric patient. Uh, is CT recommended for pediatric patient? 
Yeah, uh, in, in China, we have such uh, guidelines for pediatric patients. Uh, CT is not routinely recommended, but chest X-ray is recommended for such child patients. In Korea, same as well? Yes, uh, uh, we oppose to uh, use CT imaging or X-ray, uh, CT imaging to evaluate the uh, presence of COVID-19 in pediatric uh, patient. And uh, when I leave you the uh, literatures dealing with pediatric patients, the, uh, the severity of a uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia in uh, pediatric patients compounded with a COVID-19 is very mild, much milder than uh, the CT findings of a other patients. And the, in the clinical presentation of those pediatric patients, uh, are typically mild. So uh, if we, even if we uh, take a CT scan in those pediatric patients, I think there uh, is few a uh, clinical value uh, by applying CT scan to those patients. Okay. Um, uh, another question about workflow. Maybe this one, Yen, you can answer. So you mentioned about staff segregation. So if the team is very small, how do you segregate the staff? Okay, so it a lot of it depends on the size of the hospital. I think the other consideration for radiology is the subspecialty reporting. Um, if you are able to segregate by subspecialty and you can report off packs, it really doesn't matter where you are. So, for example, I can report my MSK studies actually from home. So as long as uh, it's important to have a, the workflow or the processes uh, thought out beforehand so that the radiographers know uh, which cases to assign to which radiologists to report, uh, whether they are actually on site or not even on site in the hospital. Uh, for small departments, you may have to have some degree of uh, cross-subspecialty um, if needed, uh, if you are not able to have uh, off-site reporting. Right. Professor Song, do you have segregation of your staff to, to I guess, like a business continuity? Because you mentioned that if they are exposed, they will be quarantined and then nobody can come to work. So what is the strategy in China in terms of... Uh, staff management to prevent, you know, entire service from shutting down? Uh, in Department of Radiology, some of our staff were um, purposely asked to stay home for a while, then while others are in service. Like uh, some doctors are working from home for the reporting. Some technicians in shifting uh, their uh, duties. Uh, for example, one work one uh, a whole day, another one work another day, and uh, ensure that somebody, uh, some uh, staff are uh, at home to, to prepare for next work. Right. Dr. Yun, in Korea, how do you deal with this problem? Uh, actually, I, I, our uh, hospital uh, institutional uh, policy recommends that uh, the uh, social distancing and uh, working at home uh, uh, for the uh, doctors uh, who uh, have have uh, who has a, a history of a, a, a travel or uh, or attending a conference or business meeting uh, outside of Korea. Right. So for working from home, uh, do you also have uh, exactly uh, like your hospital set up in terms of a PEX workstation, or is just a uh, a PC with a normal monitor? Uh, we use PC with normal monitor uh, through a cloud, the, the, the imaging cloud of the uh, Department of Radiology. Right, but the image quality, the resolution will not be as good. So would there be a problem about missing diagnosis or missing subtle findings? So we um, assign some certain part of uh, imaging studies to be uh, report from home, uh, like the uh, traditional uh, CT abdomen, MR abdomen, uh, or musculoskeletal images, they can be done from home with ordinary computers. But for mammography, for chest uh, imaging, 
they have to be done uh, with the workstations uh, within the hospital. Okay. Dr. Yun, in Korea, do you have workstation at home or also only PCs? Uh, yeah, our uh, regular staff usually uh, have their PCs, not workstations. And actually, image interpretation of CT scans is acceptable uh, in most uh, CT cases. But uh, as a Professor So mentioned, a interpretation of mammography or chest radiography uh, may be uh, suffer may suffer from the uh, suboptimal image quality of a uh, uh, on, uh, on routine PC uh, rather than a workstation. Right, Ian. You in your lecture you show uh, your home setup. So what setup is that? Is PC based, or you have a proper Baco monitor and so on? Uh, so this is PC based, uh, partly because we only recently started this uh, work from home uh, after COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic began. Um, of course, as uh, both Professor Song and Professor Yun mentioned, uh, a few of our modalities are natively digital. So ultrasound, CT, MR, for example, the MR image has a maximum uh, matrix of 512 by 512 which is uh, suitable for display on any uh, routine monitor. Uh, mm. Although we do uh, suggest that you get a large monitor so that you can see multiple series or multiple images, uh, plus the fact that it should be sort of at least ultra or full, ultra high definition or full definition or ultra sharp depending on you know, exactly which make or model that you get. Uh, the other important Thing also is uh, obviously for VPN, uh, you have to have a secure uh, but easy method of uh, logging in and uh, being able to access the, the similar work list that you would see at work. Right. Okay, the next question, there's a question about masks. Um, I guess in some countries, there is a sh shortage of N95 masks. The question is, is a surgical mask good enough for radiographers who are performing chest x-ray? Professor Song, any uh, opinion? Uh, well, if we suggest the ordinary chest x-ray, I think a surgical mask will be okay. But if the patients, is the asymptomatic patients with COVID-19, that will be some danger. So for radi uh, radiographers who have close contact or direct exposure, to uh, COVID-19 patients or suspected patients or symptomatic patients, a 95 mask will be definitely needed. Okay. Dr. Yun in Korea, is, is it the same? Uh, yes, I totally agree with a, uh, Professor Song's opinion and uh, we are trying to apply a, the same a policy to our uh, radiology department. Okay. For CT colonoscopy um, is considered an aerosol generating procedure. So, is, is there, a, do you have special protection when CT colonoscopy is performed in your department? Uh, well, in my department, we uh, seldom perform CT colonography for uh, the study of the colon abnormalities. So, during this crisis, we didn't perform CT colonography at all. Right. So same in Korea? Yes, yeah, same. Right. Yen, what about your hospital? Do you stop also CT colonoscopy? Uh, I think so, because in general, uh, because of the restrictions on the types of patients that are allowed to come in, and uh, of course, there's some fear and concern of patients coming to hospital. Our volumes have also dropped significantly. So yes, we have not done any CT colonography. Okay. Um, looks like we have uh, pretty much covered most of the questions. Um, okay, there's... Anyway, we are also almost time. Uh, maybe we'll leave a few minutes for uh, uh, Andrew later on to have his closing remarks. So I, I think uh, personally, I found this to have 
uh, been very, a very informative session. Um, and uh, this is the actually the fourth webinar that the College of Radiologists have organized. And we have con uh, continued to be very encouraged by the number of uh, participants. In fact, with each webinar, we have more and more registrants. Our first webinar, we have about uh, 300 over. And this current webinar, we have more than 1,005 uh, residents and more registrants and more than 1,000 has logged in. Uh, and we have people from all over the world. So I, I think uh, it leaves me to thank the three speakers for their excellent talks. And uh, I think I'll close this Q&A session and hand over the mic to Andrew, uh, the president of the Singapore Radiological Society, to uh, have his closing remarks. Andrew. So, uh, thank you, Prof. Thay. So, a big thanks once again to all the local overseas experts, uh, Professor Song, Dr. Yuan, Dr. Sao. Uh, it's been a very engaging and informative session. Thank you to all the participants. So we hope you enjoyed this seminar and I wish everyone a good Saturday. Okay? So we are closing this uh, session right now.